Well, let's bless him together right now. Amen. It is indeed an honor to be here tonight. And uh, it's been a long time since I have been in Jennings, Louisiana. And uh, I used to travel through here quite a bit growing up in Baton Rouge. And uh, then I went to college at McNeese. So uh, I spent a lot of time running up and down the highway and got gas a lot of times around here and late night snacks on the way home. And uh, But it is a privilege to be here refueling in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And uh, it, is, it is a single privilege to be here with uh, your fine pastor. How many love Brother and Sister Townley and their family? I was telling uh, my sister, I'm glad my sister and brother-in-law and Alexander and Annika, glad y'all are here today. And uh, they skipped their church to come hear me preach, so I can't let them down. And uh, glad they drove over. But um, I was telling them about Brother Townley, and uh, I'll just tell you what I told them. I told Marlis, I said, Brother Townley is the closest thing I know like my father. And uh, my father is a man of strength, is a man of courage. Uh, he's a man of few words, but when he speaks, it has a lot of weight. And he's a friend to all and loves all. He doesn't compromise who he is or what he believes, but he's very, he's very who he is. He doesn't let any, and that's kind of just how I feel about you. And uh, you have the same spirit as my father, and, and for me, that's a high compliment. And uh, I honor. Give your pastor and his wife another big hand. I told the men uh, at the conference, which, by the way, was outstanding. And uh, I, I didn't, I'd heard there was a good meeting and that it was well attended. Um, I thought I was going to get in trouble when I pulled in because I was the only car. Uh, I, I pulled up. Saturday morning, and uh, there was not one car in the parking lot. It was all pickup trucks, and there was a bunch of brethren standing out there, and so I had to turn on my southern drawl. I had to drop California, and I said, would it be okay if I parked this car out here with all these trucks? And they said, well, come on in. <laughs> Amen. So I apologize. I didn't drive my pickup today. I'm in a rent car that says Texas, so that's enough to get in a fight over around here. And, uh, but it's good to be on this side of the Sabine, amen, in Louisiana. I love Louisiana. And uh, uh, I went to Steamboat Bills today and got some crawfish tails. Y'all don't even know what that does to a, a boy in California that can't get it anymore. It was like a little bit of the marriage supper of the lamb ahead of time. <laughs> amen, amen. But it's good to be here, and I like what I feel. This is a worshiping church. I can, it's my first time here, but I already feel like I'm at home. I hope that's okay. Amen. Good to see my California boy here. Hey Amen. If we get in trouble, you're with me, okay? All right. And, uh, love the Hodge family and uh, thankful for what God has done in his life. And uh, as has already been stated, I've had the privilege of working the last two or three years with your pastor and his wife in Honduras. And uh, what a man of God, what a teacher of the word. And uh, this is a church that it's evident that the word of God is received. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of great preachers All right. that don't pastor great churches because there's no ebb and flow. All right. There's Good. nothing that comes back. It's not, not, not the, the movement and the interaction. And, uh, but it's obvious that this church has bought in to the message that is preached by this man of God. Praise. And I feel unity here. I feel victory here. Amen. And uh, I took a drive by your new property, and uh, it just looks like y'all just gonna gonna leave the neighborhood and take over. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What a what a beautiful location, and uh, 
I'm excited for you what the future holds. If you have your Bible, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Is it all right if I move this right here? Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and if we get there, we'll see where this goes. Um, we'll read a second scripture. I, I can't guarantee you I'll preach it. We'll just see how far this goes. But let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 to begin, and uh, let's read the first five verses. This know also that in the last days, everybody say the last days. Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of them own selves, of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. I mean, there's always been disobedient kids, but evidently it's growing. I just thought I'd slide that in there. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accuser, accusers, Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lover of pleasures more than lovers of God. This is a pretty uh, ugly list yeah. of people to encounter. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're going to be there in the last days. And just by reading the list, I think it's evident we're in the last days. Yeah. If you didn't have any other clue, just read those first four verses and you say, oh, we must be there. Yeah, right. And uh, maybe not in Jennings, but at least where I live, it's like that. But in, into this mix of obvious, problematic people is included in verse 5, a sobering thing when you think of the list that it's included with, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Let's turn over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And, uh, well, that's just what we read, wasn't it? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. What am I thinking? I'm reading my notes backwards. I was, that was a test. I was seeing if you were paying attention. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Everybody say completely. Completely. Just a little note. The word holy with a W there is the same root as we get our word H-O-L-Y. Because God intended us to be wholly complete. Okay? You're not even a complete human being unless you're a wholly separated human being in the eyes of God because you have fallen short of your purpose. So you're not completing the telos or the, that's the Greek word, the intent of the maker. Okay. He makes something with an intent. Okay. Like this pulpit was not built to be a cabinet. This could be reworked and put a sink in the top of it. And it could be a decorative piece with a sink in it and make it, but it was, that's not the telos of it. T-E-L-O-S. And my brother-in-law speaks Greek. He can straighten this out later. But, but the telos of a thing is what it was built, the intent of the constructor or the designer. All right. And so for you and I to live short of God's holiness is to live an incomplete life. All right. Amen. Yes, sir. So that boy, I could preach about that. That's a whole different. That's a whole different direction. But that's that's kind of the idea here. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely, and I pray God your whole. Everybody say whole. whole. Your whole spirit and soul and body. Say spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to preach and 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 just stay with me. This this title is going to be a little bit odd. I understand, and uh, maybe somebody's familiar with this term. Uh, if not, it was a new one to me. Just this well, 2017 is where I first heard the term, and uh, out of the term I heard, I began to investigate, and God gave me this message. I want to preach on cargo cult religion. Cargo cult religion. 
God, I ask you to move in this house right now. Anoint my lips of clay, my mind, my heart to deliver this to your people in uh, the way and manner you would like it to be done. I want your will to be done in Jesus' name. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord one more hand clap of worship. You may be seated. I thank you again for such a wonderful conference, and I was blessed by Brother Erskine and Brother Dykes, uh, but even beyond the preaching, I was blessed by the fellowship and the wonderful meals, and uh, what, a, what a neat place to have a conference. It just, it felt, it felt right, it felt good, and my uh, hat is off to this church. I know you worked hard to take care of that many people. And uh, I was blessed by being here. So I, I challenge you, continue, continue in that effort because you're making a difference. What a, what a great time it was. Amen. Cargo cult religion. As has been mentioned, my life has been, uh, well, since my childhood, uh, in and around uh, global missions, foreign missions fields. My grandfather was a missionary missionary to and church planter grew up in this part of the country uh, east texas and this part of louisiana my father was raised to quincy de ritter uh those th this whole area and so i'm i'm well familiar with this part of the country and have kin folks and all connections that go way way back but my grandfather would leave this part of the world and travel first of all to be a missionary to australia and uh, spent some time in Okinawa, as well as Greece, the Philippines, and in his 70s took my grandmother to India and uh, taught in the Bible school and pastored there. And then at 80 years old, went to Winslow, Arizona and started a church. And uh, so uh, with that as my family heritage, and I see the Spell family here, what a heritage they've got, amen. Uh, I'm thankful for my heritage. And then my uncle became a missionary to Tonga, and uh, my first cousin became a missionary to New Zealand, died there of cancer. My sister uh, spent time, number of years in Europe as a missionary, and then lastly in Greece, uh, serving there. And it was there that she met my brother-in-law in Athens, Greece. And what a wedding it was on the Aegean Sea as the water was lapping against the water. I helped perform the wedding. And man, we just felt like big shots. Thank God for missions. Uh, and uh, along with that, it was the annual event that in our church, the high school students, we had a school and Every year, our high school would go on a week of home missions somewhere in the United States. We would load up a bus, we would save our money, and would go spend a week serving uh, with a home missionary. And then for all of those that were out of high school, in that summer, there would also be seven to nine days where there was a foreign missions trip that was taken normally to Central America. Uh, and that was where we would look forward to. So my life grew up around missions. And so I have continued that. I have, uh, it got in me and I, I can't, I can't just sit at home. I've got to go reach. It's just kind of the way it is. Uh, and I appreciate that. But, uh, God opened up doors for me to some time back to minister in the South Pacific in Samoa and lately in the country of Fiji. And on uh, my first trip to the Fijian Islands, uh, I was made privy to something I had never encountered. I had never read about it. I had never heard about it. And while I was there, I was talking with a pastor, and he began to describe things that had happened during World War II in the South Pacific and what had unfolded in that part of the world that I found very interesting. I learned of a belief system in the South Pacific, primarily in Papua New Guinea, uh, but it spread to the other Pacific islands because of people migrating from one place to the other. And I listened as I was informed 
about this thing called cargo cults. It was a term that was new to me. So when I returned home from Fiji, I began to look into cargo cult. The cargo cults began during World War II. The South Pacific, as you know, was uh, a, the battleground uh, for the world powers and technology advanced uh, beyond what had ever been experienced uh, globally, but primarily in this part of the world, which were, were island people that had largely still function under a tribal system even to this day. If you travel to those, those nations and islands, they still operate with chiefs and paramount chiefs and so on and so forth. And so these were people that had largely lived off of their own little farm and sustenance and their little villages and they had a ruling system and, and uh, it was family and village base and there were chiefs and paramount chiefs and on and on the list goes. This is the way the South Pacific had operated and then into their world suddenly there comes airplanes and ships and people. The Marshall Islands is one of the places that a plane had crashed and the people thought these were gods from the heavens. As the pilot survived and climbed out of the plane, the people began to worship him. This is, there's all of these interesting stories as you travel through the South Pacific Islands. But what had happened is this part of World War II was basically fought in the front yards of the indigenous peoples. They had little technology, if any. They had little education at this point. And due to the difficulty of getting there, um, they are extremely, even to this day, isolated in a sense from California it takes to get to uh, the Fijian Islands. It takes you about 13 hours in an airplane. So you can imagine their world even 50 years ago. And so uh, now all of a sudden these isolated indigenous people that nobody knows much about other than, than uh, Captain Blythe and the book The Mutiny on the Bounty. Some of you may remember that old book that was written about uh, Captain Cook's experience on the Cannibal Islands. That, that's the part of the world we're talking about. And, and so here the Japanese were the first to arrive and they came with great supplies. It was closer to them. And so they saw these islands as important places in their strategies. We know that as Americans well. We saw what happened uh, in Honolulu and Pearl Harbor. The Japanese felt very intent on conquering and taking these islands. The Allied forces were would respond and uh, maybe some of your family and friends were a part of this as the allied forces would would invade and would capture an island at a time to take back as well as set up the beachhead so that they could get their fire powers and equipment and planes and strategy closer to the action and so they would move into imagine if you will these remote indigenous uneducated with no technology beautiful lush landscapes suddenly men are dropping from the heavens they're dropping technology and big vehicles and they're pounding and paving airplane strips and they're building ports and the world for these people have changed mm -hmm. right. and so these men roll in Men and women roll in and begin to establish their bases. They establish, and it brought such drastic changes to the little islands in the South Pacific. And you know what happened, and thank God for the victories that were accomplished uh, in that action. But have you ever thought of what happens when the conflict's over? Because now they have been for the last number of years... As the war has gone on, they are watching plane after plane after plane drop supplies in. And they're watching what was at one time just a, a lush green field next to the beach where they used to grow papayas or taro or watermelons or cucumbers. Uh, now there's a big strip and there's airplanes and there's men in uniforms and there's action and the, the skies are lit up every night. And, and then... As time goes by, peace comes, treaties are signed, the war is over, and there's just empty runways and empty hangars. Well, 
the military abandoned the bases and began because now they had honestly in, in saving the world, if you will, they had destroyed parts of culture and parts of the island. And uh, there was an obligation. There was, there was things they felt we needed to do. A lot of people know what we did in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but what we don't often talk about is 60 atomic bombs were dropped uh, near the Marshall Islands as we were testing those bombs, destroying the ecosystem and the waters and the fish died. Imagine that. We saw what it did to the cities. Look what it did to... And so there's this upheaval that was necessary, in a sense, to save the world. But So now the uh, American forces and the Allied forces felt the responsibility to continue to help uh, these people whose world had been not they, they had not been involved it was not their battle they didn't even know who hitler was they they didn't know they didn't know any of that they were isolated on the islands and and the world has been changed and so out of the i'm building this this is the reason some of you thought you said i thought i was going to church i didn't know i was going to history class y'all okay y'all you interested in this if anything you won't be bored hopefully but there was the feeling we, we, we must continue to help. And so what would happen upon abandoning the bases, we didn't want to abandon the people. So we continued to fly airplanes to drop supplies to the indigenous peoples whose land had been devastated. There was an unintended consequence to our actions because for every action, there is a reaction. These simple, isolated, often uneducated people whose world had been turned upside down now begin to view the supplies as gifts from heaven. What I'm going to tell you is true. It's going to sound like somebody made this up, but this is really true. They begin to worship a God Name Rusafel. It was their pronunciation of the name they had heard these warriors say over and over again, Roosevelt. They begin to call him the God Rusafel, who supplied the things that would fall from the heavens. There is, and still is, even to this day, a group of what are called John Frum worshipers from f-r-u-m-m -M. how did their deity get his name he came from the cargo passages that they could struggle to read that said from john and so the pronunciation became john from and they would begin to worship the deities of rusafel and john from but as time went by, our obligation lessened as the land so fertile and so beautiful and even the ecosystem and everything began to, God has made this world to function. And, and, and you go there, you, you don't see the damages today. It's, it's grown. It's, it's beautiful. It's lush. And, and the, the coral. And, and just amazing that part of the world. And, and so as the returning of, uh, uh, of health to the nation and the, the crops and the culture came back, our obligation began to cease and supplies began to come less frequently until they no longer were dropped. And the indigenous people still continued to wait for John Frum to bring supplies. They began to still call out to Rusafel to open the heavens and pour down blessings they begin to seek answers true story to pray to rusafel and what is interesting to me it boggled my mind is the abandoned runways and airstrips became centers of worship they would still see a plane fly over on its way to new zealand or australia and they would run out and cry to rusafel Open up the heavens. And they knew it was called cargo. 
and they would ask for the cargo. Rusafel, release the cargo. But the plane was just headed to Australia. It never dropped anything. And so they begin to act out. Hear me. They begin to act out and build structures and tools. You, you don't believe me, do you? So sister, sister screen lady, you got, they built, y'all can't see it, can you? Y'all go sit on the front row at least for a minute. These are real pictures. They built idols to Rusafel out of wood. They would build them. They would literally go climb in these airplanes made of wood and make the same noises sitting there in worship going. <laughs> hoping to inspire Rusafel and Jean Frum to open up the heavens and shower down the cargo. Go to the next slide. They, they built others. They would gather under the wings. They still do it today. They gather under the wings in their cargo cult worship and they make the noises of airplanes. They dance around hoping to awaken Rusafel, hoping that he will drop the blessings of food and, and materials and tools and things that they, they pray to Rusafel. You think I'm making this up? They've even built terminals. What's the, what's the next picture I sent you? That's an airplane made of wood. Copying what they saw. I mean, the, this is their ability with wood. Oh, and I could go on and on. I think I sent you a couple more, or at least one more. They remember the, the goggles the pilots would wear. They take it, they make, they make goggles out of wood, and they have all of the attire. They have all the, well, that's what it looks like. And if we, can, if we can look just right, and if we can build it just right, and we can get the sound just right that Rusafel, and, and, and go to the next slide. And if we can zero in satellites made of hay and wood, hoping to get the attention, they sit in their wooden airplanes with wooden headphones next to haystacks designed to look like satellites, making the noise of the planes, building wooden jeeps. I, I've seen the wooden jeeps hoping to get Rusafel to drop the cargo, going through the motions, making the right sounds, making it look as if it's the real thing. Building structures hoping that their worship will bring the cargo. Led by persuasive, charismatic tribal leaders who have gotten educated now. Let's jump to 2018. That even today this is still going on even though they know it's, right, it's not right. But here's what happens. As education came to the islands, they even learned how humorous it may seem to outsiders. But see what had happened. It became a culture. And you found your girlfriend in the cargo cult religion. And so now it's just done out of duty, knowing that there's no, nothing going to fall from heaven. But it's now become so much a part of their culture, they continue to trek and they continue to have ceremony and rituals where they build airplanes and build satellites and, and young people now, oh, they, 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 they speak a, a language and they go to school and they can read and write, but they have held on to their cargo cult religion because it became their way of life. And if anybody with half a brain that has just heard that story you know where I'm going. 
I wonder how many Pentecostals are doing the same thing. Going through the motions. Making a bunch of noise. Building a lot of buildings. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I'm not, I'm, this isn't a negative message. I'm not a negative preacher. But, but I, I, as I sat there and I heard and, and I saw and I talked to these people about, about this, and I was saying, my God, how could, how could this happen? But then I felt the Holy Ghost quicken me, and it was almost like God was kind of laughing like we were a while ago, saying, saying you, so many people are just making noise, and as ridiculous as it is, I wonder if sometime God sees some of our worship the same way. That we've learned how to dress it right and how to build it right and how to wave it right. And we've learned how to have Pentecostal church and we know what song to play and what little point to turn home. And we've learned, boy, you know, we, we, we can raise our hands and look at our watch at the same time to, to see how what time it is. And, oh, we're not out doing all those worldly things, thank God. But, but we're sometimes going through the motions expecting God to open up the windows of heaven and shower down the cargo. Lord, you, I, wonder, I wonder how many of us, we just go straight to God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. I wonder how much of our dancing, running, shouting, singing, building, working is really about cargo. And what I felt the Holy Ghost tell me is what I'm wanting is more than worship for what you're going to get. But I want you to worship me out of a love, out of a relationship that moves beyond what I can give you, but moves beyond God, what can I give back to you? Why don't we just do that right now? Come on, we're not just going to go through the motions, but let your heart get in this thing. Let your spirit get in this thing right now. I I don't want to be, you may be seated, I don't want to be guilty of cargo cult religion. Let's just be honest. We've learned how to have church. And I like good church. I like Pentecostal church. I like it of all kinds. I mean, I've been all over the world. I've been, I've been all over the nation. I've been in all kinds of, and everybody's got a little different. They, they got their own, their own cultural mix of it. I, I like it all. And, and there's nothing worse than a dead Pentecostal church. Man, if it's dead, I mean, a dead Baptist church is kind of expected to be dead Baptist, right? You know, you get out too much out of order, they'll come take you out. I've been in places where they tell you to sit down and be quiet. Yeah. And you kind of expect that. I've been in cathedrals around the world where, where, where I, I, I took out, I was overseas, and I took out my phone to see because I, I was supposed to meet my wife on the other side of town. We were there on vacation, and I, I stopped in this cathedral, and I pulled out my phone, and, and there was one of these, these big fancy dressed. They told me to put that up. You know, we, yes, sir. I didn't know if they was going to stab me or something. I didn't know what was going on, but. It's kind of expected, just kind of. But when you come to a Pentecostal church, you kind of expect some stuff to happen, right? I mean, we, we've been labeled holy rollers. I, I've been in places where they think, well, that means you just get on the floor and roll around. That's not, what that, that's not where that term came from. You know where that term came from? That term came from Azusa Street. Well, actually, before it was the Bonnie Bray House. If you've ever been to the Bonnie Bray House where the Holy Ghost fell, it was on the side of a hill goes down to the street. It's, it's literally, it's probably twice as high as this up to the bottom of, from the street to the house. And there were so many people that got crammed in that place when the Holy Ghost started falling. They would get out on the porch and they would try to look in and, and the Holy Ghost would hit and they would get to worship it and they would fall off that slope and they'd wind up rolling down and so people started calling them holy rollers. Some of y'all didn't know that. Well, you see, it's history 101. Now you know. I like Holy Roller Church. I, I'm not against shouting and dancing and, and, and doing all the things we do. I, I, I'm like Paul. I do it more than you all. I like what I feel. But I want to make sure 
that I haven't just learned the Pentecostal catechisms and the rituals of what Pentecost is and in the process of doing the form of godliness that I'm really not tapping into the power. I don't want to be guilty of... I want when I'm dancing. I don't want just my legs in it. I want my heart in it. I don't want just my hands in it. I want my spirit in it. God, I need your power. I'll clap. I'll sing. I'll dance. I'll glorify you with this body. But Lord, would you get a hold of my spirit? Would you get a hold of my heart? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was surprised to learn that the scientific community has taken this phenomenon and applied it, applied it within the scientific community as a term when process resembles science. When process resembles science without understanding the true nature of what they are doing. So they're running tests and it resembles a certain scientific step but they don't fully understand, and so the scientific community now, because of this phenomenon in the South Pacific, they call it cargo cult thinking. I wonder how many people just worship without understanding and go through the motions of hand clapping and, and holiness attire, but they don't understand the nature of what they're doing going through the motions with the form, the process, singing songs, clapping hands, running, jumping, dancing, shouting. I, I'm a pastor, okay? And it, I'm just going to tell you the way it is sometimes where I'm at, not here in Jennings. It's not how high you jump. It's how straight do you walk when your feet hit the floor. Brother Young, are you against the motion? No. You miss that. You miss that if you think that. Are you against holding the standards? No, not at all. They're necessary. But thinking that if we get the outside right, that's all there is to it. Thinking that if we shout hard enough or dance loud enough or whatever it may be, that's going to produce the favor from God. Are we guilty at times of going through worship rituals? Thinking that if we do the rituals at our social gatherings. I sat in a service not long ago in Pastor Townley, a church that if I were to name the location... Many of you would know, Brother Townley would. At one time, one of the most powerful churches in the Pentecostal movement. A strong, vibrant, growing church. I preached there a number of times, and people received the Holy Ghost every time I had ever been there. It was known as a revival church. I sat in a service. I was there for a special occasion that was out of the ordinary. As I sat there, I could see the structure. I could see the form. It was hip. It was cool. It been a long time since I had been there. I looked around, and they had basically dressed the part. The preacher gave a cool sermon with a lot of attention to the verbiage and the detail. It was well thought out. You could tell he had spent a lot of time. And he even threw in a few holiness statements to appease the ancestors that were close by. But I got to be honest, I didn't feel very much. And I tried, Pastor Townley, to what was missing. The words were right. The appearance was pretty on point. They were singing some of the same songs, but it felt like cargo cult. Godliness and righteousness was not actually a reality. There was form. It was a fashion. 
it was a generation that had learned the system for personal gain. And God was really not at the center of life. It was, what's the term, an empty suit? Dressed up, but empty. This is what Jesus said of the Pharisees. He said, you're white as sepulchers, but you're full of dead men's bones. Once a year, they would come whitewash the sepulchers, to, not, for clean, uh, not for cleanliness or to make it sterile. Or, it was simply to make it look good. It really wasn't clean at all. Jesus was saying, you, you, you've got all the form. You've got all the fashion. You, you know how to whitewash everything. You know how to make it look <coughs> just right. But he said, I can look in the heart, and you're full of dead men's bones. What he was saying is there's no life there. There's no life there. Well, Brother Young, you came to Jennings to preach that to us? Not because I think you're guilty. I preach this to my church, and they're not guilty. But I learned one thing. You take your vitamins. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. God, don't let the apostolic church become a cargo cult religion. Don't let the strong side of faith get weak on the inside and deteriorate from the inside out. But let us, when we worship, move beyond just clapping and singing and let that clapping and singing be an expression of a depth in our spirit where God has poured his fire and the heavens have opened up, yes, but not just to pour blessing down, but to ignite something inside of me. I don't want to be guilty of going through the form of righteousness and worship with God being absent from my being. I close with this. We are tripartite beings. We are body, soul, and spirit. You may be seated. Say body, soul, and spirit. That's how we exist. We understand our body. Our body, we operate through the five senses. We taste, we touch, we see, we smell, we hear. We are sensual, those senses. And it's through those senses that we interact with our world. But we also know that our body is not all there is to who we are. We know that we have a soul. What is our soul? Our soul is our mind. It's our imagination. It's our thoughts. It's our memories. It's our personality. It's our ego. It's, it's us. And there's the interplay between our soul and our body. And your body reacts to your soul. And your soul can react to your body. For instance, let's use the, the idea of fear. Fear is a, an emotion. It's from our soul. Our soul has fear in it. That's an emotion. Fear is in our mind. Our soul. And so we have thoughts, and therefore our body can react to that soulful thing called fear. For example, if we were to turn all the lights out, everybody go home, and, and uh, you for some reason realize you left your wallet at the church, and you came back by yourself about two in the morning because you had to catch a flight and needed your license. So you came to the church at two in the morning. And all the lights are off and Brother Townley's not there. And nobody's singing and nobody's worshiping. Churches can be a little spooky at 2 in the morning. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Y'all are, are nodding? And, and uh, you know, you didn't leave your wallet at the back on the table by the coach. You, you, you left it right here. And so that means you got to walk down that long aisle. And for some reason, you couldn't find the lights. And you know what we do? Jesus, I want to thank you. Jesus. We're, 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 because our, our soul is, we're a little bit, and, and you'd get about right here where this good brother is, and reaching for your purse in the dark, and out of your left peripheral, there's a brother that's laying on that bench, and he just rises up and goes, ah. 
your soul would feel something, but your soul would cause your body to react. And you would either come about that high off the ground, or you would punch, you would either fight or flight. I promise you, you just wouldn't go, hey, dude, what's up? <laughs> there would be something in your body that would react to your soulless emotion. And this is the way our body interacts. This is the way our being interacts. And what happens is we get a taste for things, and we like things in our soul. Soul food, soul music. It, it, it's appealing to our, our desires, and we, we, we create appetites. We love Cajun food. And so we partake of it with our body. And we develop this memory. Oh, remember, remember those boiled crawfish? You, you remember that? Remember those enchiladas? I mean, remember that roast that great? And we got this, it's memories and it's nostalgia. And, and boy, we and we develop this taste and we love to go with our body, partake of that. We understand that. But see, that interplay also has some problems in it. Because those appetites can drive us to eat more than we should and we get unhealthy. Are we develop an appetite in our soul that came out of an emotional need that may be molested or hurt or abused or neglected? We turn to a bottle. Our peer pressure. Peer pressure is an emotion. Talk to most of the addicts that are out there. They started, maybe, maybe they started with a gateway drug at school, a cigarette, a, 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 a joint, trying to appeal to an emotional, I'm going somewhere, to an emotional need. And so... By their emotional need, with their body, they smoke a joint, not realizing that they're working a pretty serious problem because the need and the emotions created an action in the body that then that action with the body created an appetite in the soul, and the soul desired the thing, and it goes back but now there's a problem setting in is the body gets addicted like the soul had an appetite. And it becomes a vicious cycle until it becomes addiction. And it's not just in the mind. The body physically gets addicted. And so that affects, remember we're talking soul, body, soul, spirit. And the soul is now desirous of the thing the body's craving. But then the body craves it so much it affects the mind and drug addicts lose their mind. Not their mental capabilities at first, but the way you see it beginning is they lose their ability to reason and they'll spend all their money on Friday after they get their paycheck at the bar because their body craved that alcohol, the body craved that drug and they only made $500 that week but they just dropped 250 for marijuana not giving thought to the diapers needed and the food needed and the, the rent payment. And so they're not even thinking right because their mind is now controlled by the body. Amen. You with me? Yes, sir. By the way, young people, you, you don't need to play that game. Right. You, you don't need to play. I don't care what your peers are doing. Don't give in to the soulless need to be accepted. So I have a responsibility to this body. I'm to glorify God with my body. And, and the scripture we read, well, I guess we got time to get to it, okay? I'm to that second passage we read. He said that, that our spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. I got to make sure my body's blameless. I got to glorify God with this body. I don't need to be doing anything that would bring glory to God with this body. But I also have a responsibility with my mind. I have to control. Where, where's lust? It's played out in my body, but it's in my soul. It's in my mind. I have the responsibility. He said, he, 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 that's what Jesus is talking about. He said, he that looketh on a woman. What he's saying is you, you got a responsibility of your mind too, not just your body. Well, I didn't do anything. No, you got to make sure your soul is sanctified too. So you got to do more than just come go through the motions with your body. You got to make sure your soul's in this thing. You, you, you got to create some appetites that are right that are going to affect your body. 
But here's the problem. The world's living not holy, H-O-L-Y. Therefore, they're not W-H-O-L-L-Y. They're not complete. The world is living as bipartite beings, not tripartite, because they're living in the soulish, fleshly, carnal. That's the carnal man. They're, they're in this cycle of body, soul, body, soul, body, soul. They got spas. They got massage parlors. They got, they got drug dens. They got pleasure houses. They got good, they got good restaurants. And, and life's about what, what, what good thing can I find? What, what, where, where, let's go to Disneyland. Life is about saving enough money to go get a little pleasure for a season. I mean, that, that, that's what the world is for. Can we make enough money to retire with a good house and a good car? And, uh, and, and can we have a good family? That's the world's life. The cycle of body and soul, body and soul, body and soul. So how, wh- wh- why am I preaching this? Because you got one more part in you. Your spirit. The spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. That's old English language to say. It's like if I were, if I were putting it in modern vernacular, the spirit of a man is where God ignites a fire like a flashlight that shines in your soul and body. What are you saying, Brother Young? Let me just, let me break it real down, down real simple. And, and if this gets wrong, your pastor's right and I'm wrong. But let me, let me tell you how I see this thing. You and I are body, soul, and spirit. When man sinned in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the judgment was the day you eat of that tree, what's going to happen? Did they die? Well, they want, you know, the deep theological, yeah, there was separation from God, the spiritual death. That's what we always say. But let's just get real plain. They didn't die. But yet they did die. They lived like 900 and something years. So they lived a long time. They lived longer than you and I are living, and we're trying to be good apostolics. Those sinners live 900 years. <laughs> 900 years they lived. But yet they were dead the moment they ate the fruit. Here's what died. Their body didn't die. And their soul didn't die. Their spirit died. That part of humanity, everybody in this city that don't have God in their life is dead in sins and trespasses. They're, 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 they're spiritual zombies is what they are. They have, yeah, they got a good functioning body and they got a good functioning soul or they got a bad functioning body with a bad functioning soul, but they're alive, but yet they're dead. Because the spirit of that man and woman is empty. That's what the devil looks for. That's what the Bible's referring to when it talks about it seeks dry places. It's looking for a home so that he can take you captive at its will. Here's a good way to understand. I'll get back to my message and I'll wrap it up. Musicians that come. Is that what happens is this is the way I want you to see. This is the way I understand it in my mind and in, in my understanding. Everybody say, my spirit, my spirit is, renewed. is renewed. The day I got up from an altar, from a pew, and went to the altar on a Sunday night in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on the left-hand side, and I repented of my sins. Uh, I came up out of that altar talking in tongues that night at 13 years old. Uh, I was a new creature in Christ Jesus the moment that happened, Brother Hodge. But my name was still Miles. And I still had the same history, and I still had the same. I still love fried chicken. I still love green beans. My soul had the same memories. I still spoke the same language. I was the same person, but yet I was a new man. What was new? That new man walking in my shoes. You get the Holy Ghost tonight with a bad back. You're going to leave with a bad back, unless God heals you. You're going you're gonna to go to the altar with diabetes and get the Holy Ghost and you're going to leave with diabetes unless there's a miracle. 
What was not new was your body. You didn't pray through an altar and lose 50 pounds. Well, it'd be nice. We'd all come talk in tongues, wouldn't we? Oh. We'd be like... But what was made new was our spirit. You see, here it is. My spirit is renewed. My soul is is being renewed and my body will be renewed. So here's what you and I got to do to make sure we don't get into cargo cult religion. Is because my flesh is not renewed yet. I don't yet have a glorified body. If this is a glorified body, boy, we got a bad deal. And my body has got some appetites that my soul created. And what's going to happen is my body's going to keep talking to my soul and my soul's going to keep talking to my body and that lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, it's wanting to work on my body. My body's wanting to work on my soul and, and that part of me is just, boy, all of us, even the most spiritual among us, we're still human beings. Paul said, my, my goodness, I mean, the thing I want to do, I don't do, and the thing I don't want to do, and I want to, you remember, that's the mighty apostle Paul. My God, if it, the apostle Paul saying that, what about us? He said, who's going to deliver me from this present death? I mean, it's just attached to me. I'm just getting, that's why he said, I got to die daily. What is he saying? Is he saying, I need that unction. I need that. I I want us to sing, singers, I want us to sing that song you were singing, that second song about like a burning fire blowing this place. Because I can't just come in here and, and just do my little church thing. I can't do this just because I like that song. Think about that. Man, I love that song. Yeah, but can you worship when you don't love the song? Oh, I love it when they sing that song. (laughs) Yeah, I understand that. I like that too. People cry at Whitney Houston. Well, not now, but they did. I got to get updated. I don't know who the new singers are. I mean, people used to fall out when Elvis would touch them. That's soul, brother. That's soul stuff. We got to move beyond just the soulish desires and appetites. We've got to have the wind of the Spirit. Why? Because my flesh is evil and wicked. It wants to take me down. There's appetites in me and there's tendencies in me and there's attitudes in me and there's things in me that have happened that have been perpetrated in my life that are ugly I gotta make sure that fire is burning in my spirit that begins to input and download into my soul so you're gonna serve God so you're gonna live for God Uh, I need that spirit I need the spirit of God burning in my spirit so like a mighty fire like a rushing wind blow in this house Uh, why cause I need it Brother Townley, come help me. I need you to sing that song here. I don't know. I, I don't know that song, but I liked it. If you're here and you don't want to just go through the motion, I know we could come clap and I know we could come oh, sing. Yes. But when you step out of that aisle, oh, yes. I want you to come and say, God, ignite the flame in my spirit. Flame in my spirit. I know my knees are hurting and my back's hurting and I'm a little overweight and I got a headache. But God, I got to go back to work tomorrow. I got to go back to the field tomorrow. I got to go back to the plant tomorrow. Yeah. I got to go teach yeah. those kids tomorrow. I can't operate in the soul and the body. I need my spirit. I I need my spirit illuminated. I I need the fire. I don't want cargo called religion. I don't want to just go through the motions. Uh, Blow in this house. Uh, Blow in this house right now. Spirit rain. Rain.
just thinking. I need the fire. Like you're raging. Like a mighty wind 
your Holy Spirit reign like a raging fire. your spirit hallelujah in the name of Jesus come on set my soul on fire Lord set me on fire give me the spirit of power give me the spirit of love give me the spirit of a sound mind on fire in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name hallelujah hallelujah don't accept coldness don't accept carnality press your way in the spirit hallelujah
Jesus. Come on, follow the Holy Ghost for a little bit. Come on, I feel like the Holy Ghost wants to touch in a special way right now. Come on, follow it through. Join with someone right now. Let's pray together. Pray the blessing of the Lord upon your brother. Come on, let's unite in sincerity. Let us become one. Let us become one. A company of one right now, presenting ourselves to the Lord. We're yours, God. We put ourselves on the altar, Lord. Send the fire. Consume us, God, with your glory. The spirit and the power of your will and the joy of the Holy Ghost. The joy and the power of the Holy Ghost. Joy of the power of the Holy Ghost. Joy of the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, this and courage in the spirit. Oh, this and courage in the spirit.
Come on, I feel it breaking through now. Come on. Woo! Oh, glory to God. Woo! Kalabo Shayara Bahaya. Yarobo Shara Bakiya Talabo. Ura Bayatalabo Shayata. 